Uh, yes, hello, my name is Sean Haynes. Um, I'm an IEEE Ada Kappa Nu member. Um, I was inducted out of Northeastern University in Boston, um, where I got my undergraduate degree and I've got my master's degree from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. So um, I would like to introduce our three panelists tonight. We have Jennifer Young Baker. Um, she, is, uh, she is a PMP, she's got a PMP certification. And uh, we got Greg Vaughn, uh, he's a professional engineer, and we got Dr. Craig and Shelton, uh, who has a CISSP. The way this will work is that the three panelists will introduce themselves briefly. We have some slides to go through, and then during that time, if you have questions, feel free to enter them into the Q&A panel. And then after we go through the three introductions for the panelists, we will then start answering the questions in the Q&A panel. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Jennifer to introduce yourself. Hello, um, my name is Jennifer Young Baker. Um, I have been a project professional for just over 30 years. I started out as a business analyst and then a project manager, a program manager, a portfolio manager, and a PMO director. I have seven advanced certifications in my, um, to my credit, I guess you would say, um, PMP just being one of them. Um, one of the wonderful things about the field of project management is there are so many avenues to pursue. So you can um, focus on the business side where you can be more um, uh, experienced in a change management type fashion, um, more in agile, the software development side, or on the engineering and construction side. I've been fortunate enough over my tenure um, to work in all of those areas, and I hope to share some of that experience with you today. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Greg Vaughn and let him introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Vaughn. I am a Ada Kappa new member as well as Sean, and uh, my experience is uh, as a professor of electrical and computer engineering for about 40 years. But during that same time, I held a engineering license. So I was able to uh, do quite a bit of consulting work with the local industry and some industry that's not so local to my home state of Alabama. And today I'm, I'm gonna talk with you about uh, engineering licensure. So let's uh, go through a few slides. Uh, licensure is a legal issue that applies to engineers. And the reason is here, all states and jurisdictions have laws that require persons who practice engineering to hold a license that was issued by whatever state or jurisdiction that they're practicing within. Now, rather than say state and jurisdiction all through this talk, I'm just gonna abbreviate it and please understand that places like the District of Columbia are included and they also have licensing boards. The purpose of all engineering law is to protect the health, safety and welfare of the public. So, the license that is required to practice engineering is a professional engineer's license, often called a PE license. And I have one of those, and I have had for many years. Uh, this license is similar to a physician's license and many other licenses issued by the state uh, because it seeks to protect the health, safety, and welfare of citizens of the state. Uh, like other professions, engineering is a learned profession. Now, that means that it requires extensive knowledge of math, physics, engineering principles in order to be able to do the work of an engineer. And the state, any state, has, the, has an interest in ensuring that in individuals who offer engineering services actually are qualified to do so. So it is assumed and enforced by the state that 
one, a, an engineer who has a license, has the needed education, experience and technical knowledge, and also accepts the obligation from a code of ethics point of view to protect the health, safety and welfare of the public. Here's a short uh, synopsis of the process of obtaining a license. Well, a license allows one to practice engineering and to offer engineering services to the public. Well, what does it mean to practice engineering? All the states have a law that defines the practice of engineering, and it includes things like uh, being able to own a business. But how are these laws enforced? Every state also has an engineering board to oversee the administration of the state law regarding engineering licensure. And although the states are different and each one has its own set of laws, there's quite a bit of commonality in the engineering law from state to state. In fact, all the states have banded together and created an institution called the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying, or NCEES, and they've given to this organization the responsibility of it writing and administering the examinations that are needed to verify the qualifications of candidates for licensure. So what can you do if you have a license? Well, you can practice engineering. And we're gonna to get to, in a little while, how can people who don't have a license make a living? That's an interesting question. Well, what does practice engineering mean? It means, in most states, are owning an engineering firm or being an engineering consultant, signing or and or sealing, which really mean the same thing, an engineering design, bidding for public money on a engineering project, uh, advertising one's services as an, in, as an engineer and calling oneself a professional engineer. There are three big steps to getting a license and we're gonna go over those briefly. The first step has to do with education. In most states, it is required that one have a degree from an approved program of engineering study. And in most states, that approved program, in fact, in all the states, that approved program is an ABET EAC accredited program and you may recognize ABET is the accrediting agency for engineering and technology, and EAC stands for the Engineering Accreditation Commission. So this, this ensures a, an education that would back to the principles of math and physics and chemistry and whatever else is required as well as engineering to be qualified to do engineering work. Second is experience. In most states, one can have four years of progressive experience in the engineering field in order to obtain a license. And usually this means working under the supervision of somebody who already has an engineering license or similar thing. And the third step in the process is passing two examinations. There is the fundamentals of engineering examination, which comes in various flavors. And then there is the principles and practice examination, which comes in a lot more flavors. So let's look at these examinations in more detail. First is the FE or fundamentals of engineering examination. And this examination really is seven different examinations. It is designed to be taken in the senior year of an engineer's undergraduate work or shortly thereafter. 
And currently it is a computer-based six-hour examination. Uh, it is available and one can sign up for it and register to take this examination at ncws.org slash exams. And you can also find the specifications of more or less how many questions are on each subject. There are a total of 110 questions on this examination. And for example, the subjects covered by the electrical and computer engineering fundamentals of engineering exam are listed on this slide. I'm not gonna go over them, but you can see things that should look familiar to you. And if you want more detail, you can go to nceesorg slash exams and find it out for yourself. Next is the principles and practice of engineering or the PE exam. This is the, uh, the more complete exam, uh, more difficult and uh, covers practice as well as fundamentals. In the electrical area, there are three such exams. Choose one. They are the computer engineering exam, the electrical elect and electronics and communications exam, and the power exam. Power is primarily for engineers who are interested in machinery and power transmission and distribution. You can download the specifications for all of these exams at nces.org. The PE exam reflects real world practice. It is written by practicing licensed engineers and it covers more than the basics that, that one learned in college. This test, in spite of its size and scariness, kind of, it, it's designed to test for minimal competency. That means if you pass the test, you are minimally qualified to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public in your engineering work. That's all it says. Uh, the uh, electronics, communications, and controls exam, as well as the computer engineering exam, will be offered computer-based in October 20, 2021, slightly less than a year from now. It, those two exams are offered once a year on one day only. The power exam is offered at any time you like, and you can schedule it with one of these exam uh, administration uh, facilities. Uh, all of the exams, the FE and PE exam, include an online reference handbook, which you can download for free before the exam so you can know what it is. Now, in most states, doing all this the experience, the two exams, the education, registering with the state, paying your license fee, will get you an exam for a year or two. But after that, you have to maintain the exam and maintain the license by continuing the practice that you've learned so far. Most states require at least 15 professional development hours per year in order to maintain a license, in addition to all the other things you have to do, like pay the annual licensing fee and be sure you practice by all the rules. And I, I have held a license for, for quite a number of years. So maybe this is a little bit of help to you who are deciding if licensure is the path you should take. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Craig and Shelton, and uh, he has some slides to show you also. Good evening. Uh, 
Sean brought me into this group with a slightly different perspective. I will tell you that I've been a uh, member of IEEE for some time. I am a senior member of IEEE, but I came into this route by way of my membership in the Computer Society first. Now, historically, going back to my freshman year in college, I did start out in a free engineering program in a combined liberal arts college to engineering school program. Took my uh, one hour, one semester hour class in, believe it or not, slide rule management use and mechanical drawing to get started. But by sophomore year, I converted to chemistry and ended up uh, finishing my undergrad degree in chemistry. The approach for the overall topic we wanted to get to here is what, how to approach your own decisions on continual learning, lifelong learning, and keeping an eye on keeping yourself constant throughout your career. So I'm going to talk about some of the other tools beside that include the uh, professional engineer license structure that you may find useful. Uh, start off with a general concept. Uh, you hear the word credential in a lot of different ways. If a law enforcement officer says, uh, I've got my credentials, that's his badge and ID card. But more broadly, what I'm going to approach is the idea that a credential is anything that helps give a shorthand to somebody else about you. So you can see on the slide some of the aspects that may be presented <clears throat> in a quick way to somebody else that will tell them more than just your name or what your face looks like. Now, there's lots of examples of things that count as credentials, and they're useful in a variety of different environments. Some of the most important that we'll get into uh, in a moment deal with uh, academic and, uh, degrees, academic certificates, industrial certificates, and licensing and professional certification. There's lots of others, too. Uh, if you have obtained a public title, that, in a way, is a, uh, a credential. Greg and I both have the title of doctor, but they mean very different things. And these days with the uh, virus going on, we both should avoid using that title in public lest we be mistaken for a physician. But that title still may uh, provide a credential in a, in a particular environment. Now, there's a lot of reasons to get a credential. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the obtaining a credential can often be a key marker point in your own lifelong learning plan and accomplishments. Some credentials get you past the HR screening so you can get a job. They can give you access into different areas you want to get to. What I believe one of the most important aspects of any credential uh, that I've used is to use that as a structure for doing more learning. You want to learn something new. Uh, do you want to uh, learn how to do, fix the electrical wiring in your house and you're not a, uh, an electrical engineer, you may want to go to electrician class and find out what uh, that class teaches the guy who actually has to wire the house. Uh, another reason for getting a, any particular credential is networking within your field or within the community. Uh, now this has two levels. There's networking you do while working on attaining the credential. There's also networking that you can do once you possess it. That latter is how Sean and I got together through the uh, information security field, where we both take part in the uh, uh, community forum for folks certified in one particular set of information security and related uh, professional certifications. Uh, an important one that loops back in on the uh, what Greg was talking about is that it's evidence of expertise. Professional certifications and professional licenses both put you into, here's a quick card that shows I know what I'm talking about on this subject. You also find uh, if you, particular jobs you want, either to get a job or to keep it, you may need to get a certificate or a certification, or you may need to have a degree to get into it. One of the good things about seeking a uh, particular credential rather than just wandering around and watching YouTube videos or uh, taking uh, online uh, free classes is you commit to a goal to work your way through and reach the whole area there. Quite honestly, there's a person, certain amount of personal ego there. Uh, formal credentials and their records are a way for you to keep score. And we have what some people uh, will refer to as merit badge collection. There are people that you'll see their uh, uh, 
bio or their uh, business card that may have 30 or 40 different sets of initials on them, many of which you will have no idea what they are. Uh, there is a point at which they may simply be merit badge collecting because they like getting those. There are others that uh, there's an absolute positive reason for each. I uh, knew a fellow several years ago that was in my field, in Sean's field of uh, information security and computer systems, who had about eight of them, and I wondered, asked him why so many. He had a very good reason. He was an instructor for programs to develop students for each of those. So very good reason for doing that. Now, I need to make some distinctions here of what you may uh, find yourself looking at. An industry certificate will be usually from either uh, an industry association or a particular uh, commercial vendor. Most of the time, you get that certificate for showing up for class. A few of them will have uh, uh, an exam that you have to pass, but you really need to know which is which. You will learn something if you pay attention, but there are some people who just go to get the piece of paper to put on their wall, and they don't really learn. Academic certificates are an interesting side issue that have been around for a long time. When I was working on my master's degree in the uh, mid-80s, the program I was in also offered uh, several different certificates of accomplishment. The overall course program as a non-thesis master's required uh, 12 courses. But if you selected three particular ones, you could get a certificate in that field. And so my degree was in systems management, but by selecting three particular elective courses, I also got a certificate from uh, the same university that was in uh, information systems. So that was really formalizing my work in the computer field. Uh, professional certifications take it to another layer. Professional certifications, while they may occasionally be cited in uh, legal or regulatory requirements, their purpose is to provide an ongoing uh, affirmation that an individual has expertise in that field in a combination of experience and uh, usually examined processes. There's a certain amount of overlap of that level of what happens with such a certificate with the uh, professional engineer. The big difference is as we move into the PE, like Greg was talking about, that's a form of license. Anytime you hear license, just as Greg pointed out, that's a governmental, either a legal or regulatory position, and the regulations are based upon law. So with all of those areas, I will tell you that over my career, I've concentrated on uh, just about all of them, academic certificate. Uh, if you look at my bio, you see, you'll see I spread my academic work out for formal degrees across about 40, over 40 years, uh, rather than front-loading everything like the traditional research university PhD does, uh, and then going out to work. The reason we bring all this up is that this gives you a, a basis for planning where you want to uh, throw your attention, when do you need to look for a particular opportunity and pursue it, and move into the uh, philosophy of what you learned in the degree that you just got or about to get is probably, especially in the technical and engineering areas, only going to do you good for about five years. So how are you going to keep moving forward in your field and know what you're doing? Uh, as Jennifer said, there's a lot of management issues that are covered by professional certifications. The program management uh, professional, which she has, the uh, certified information system security professional, which Sean and I both have, those are actually uh, management uh, certifications, which require not only a level of, ex of a demonstrated experience and passing a formal examination, but to be maintained just like the PE requires continuing education, uh, usually on a, a annual or biannual basis, depending upon the certification. I will tell you that I've used a couple of certifications to learn things and have decided not to pursue the certification itself. So in addition to the work I did to get my CISSP, I took full course and study to prepare for it, both the systems engineer certification under NCOSI, CSEP, Certified System Engineering Professional, and an advanced level by the same organization on information security, on information system security engineering, ISEP. I got what I needed at the education point. I did not need to go forward 
with the uh, examination and completion. But that, those are just examples of planning the timing, focus, and a lot of times your focus will be based upon the market you're in. I will tell you that in about 1998 to 2000, when I was working from uh, transitioning from straight information technology into uh, information system security, as a uh, contracting consultant, this is after I retired from the Air Force and moved into the uh, contractor world, I kept running into clients and potential clients in the field who said, I'm a CISSP, it's important you should be one. That's what's called in the uh, business world a clue. And I said, okay, if my potential clients are all saying I need to be this, then I will pursue it. So that was the first professional certification I dove into. Uh, you can use these with continuing education or continuing professional education as a way to structure a lot of your plan. There's a lot of flexibility there. So with that, uh, with this slide here leading into the issues of what, what should you look for, when should you, uh, what considerations might you individually want to have, I'm going to turn it back over to Sean and we can go into a broad discussion. Okay, thank you. Craig, um, I do want to remind everyone, if you have any questions for our panelists, please enter the questions into the Q&A panel and we'll get to those as they come up. <clears throat> I have the first question from our panel. Uh, the question is, why is it so difficult to transfer PE licenses from one state to another? I suppose that one's aimed at me. I'll be happy to answer it. Uh, the, the law for each state requires that to practice in that state, one has to be licensed in that state. Now, the uh, states have gotten together and uh, established some kind of, they call it comedy. That's not as in I'm going to a comedy club to laugh. It's comedy meaning a common a, a common theme together and they they've authorized the national council to be a records holding uh, organization so that now one can submit one's credentials to the national council by national council i mean nces just like i've talked about earlier and you and they are they already know if you pass the exams you can submit your education you could submit your experience and then the national council at your request will supply that information to another state or jurisdiction into which you you want to uh, you want to get a license and that will help streamline the process but the bottom line is you have to meet the requirements for licensure in that destination state and pay the fees and there are some subtle differences that are in those requirements that you now must meet in the additional states. I have friends who have licenses in maybe a dozen states. And um, it's a bit of a pain keeping all those licenses current, even, even with the National Council's records program. That's the best answer I've got. I'd like to add a little something there, and uh, let's go back to, let's see, go my, my examples. The um, dirty little secret of state licensure, oh, we can use other distinctions. The, the dirty secret of state licensure programs is that not only are those credentials based upon the safety and security of the populace, in many cases, and I do not have never heard this uh, applied to the PE, I'm going to make that clear, but in many yeah. cases, it's actually put in place as a way to limit the number of people entering the field in order to maintain a certain level of income for those who already made it over that hurdle. Think about what it takes to be a uh, uh, hairstylist or a barber and understand that a few years ago in uh, Louisiana, hair braiders, which is a, a, a very popular uh, limited activity in terms of the skill, and especially minority communities, 
were told they had to get the same training as uh, full beauty salon hairstylists. So uh, the old guild system of limiting access to the business available is actually is part of what's happened in many licensure programs. In my field of information system security, we ran into this in Texas and North Carolina where state laws were passed requiring anybody who was going to do forensic analysis of computer records and systems had to be fully licensed as a private investigator. Again, this was a way to limit business. So the question of why is it so hard to transfer? Sometimes you're running into that hidden process in state licensing in addition to the general broader efforts that Greg just discussed. I'd like to chime in on this one as well. Um, I've done a lot of training, um, particularly project management training. In, in several states, um, project management training is considered a continuing education credit for those that have a PE license. I worked for Duke Energy for quite some time and we often had um, uh, licensed engineers move from one state to another. And one of the challenges that we frequently came up on is some of the continuing education units individuals had used to maintain their certification were valid in one state and not in another. So for example, project management certification I and mean, project management classes towards your certification worked in North and South Carolina, but it did not in Florida. So the individuals that moved back and forth um, sometimes had a harder time transferring their license, not so much from the actual exam, but because of me how they maintain their license afterwards. Um, so that is a challenge in some respect, state to state, that um, has happened um, in um, past, um, perhaps with the process that Greg was talking about, that will be streamlined and a little bit easier going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, I wanna just remind everyone to keep those questions coming. Um, the next question I have is, what kind of pay bump is the PE license worth, or does it just re regency area of practice in your opinion? So um, I would like to actually, uh, I would say that we wanna maybe expand that to more than just PEs, but different certifications also have uh, could potentially have some worth to your employers. So um, who would like to take that? I'll be happy to comment on it. Um, the, my PE license has been worth quite a bit of money to me. I'll just start off with that. Um, and I could not do the things that I have done without it. Um, in other disciplines, um, in some companies, particularly civil engineering or power companies, there is a defined bonus for having a license as an engineer. In other companies, there's no such thing. So it depends a lot on the industry or the company or the situation that you find yourself in, if there's any benefit at all. Now, personally, there is a benefit, but that may not be very financial in that you've, you've achieved a, a rather difficult hurdle and that, that is personally satisfying. Maybe someone else would like to continue these comments. Well, one of the areas that I'm not sure you could say it, it benefited the of a specific dollar amount, but it goes back to where there may be employment requirements for such. Uh, I My time as a uh, uh, system security engineer and information systems has been uh, all working for the U.S. federal government and dominantly the Department of Defense. Uh, about 15 years ago, the Defense Department decided that people doing computer security and information security needed to do more than just say they were good at it. So uh, a program was put in place to require certification using one of about a half a dozen different professional certifications to uh, keep the job. It took me a while. Uh, I and two others in, in our company had to convince up to the vice president level that that was going to apply to our existing and future contracts. 
But what it did was get the company supporting folks getting certified under professional certification and make sure that we could operate under the required defense department contracts where they added to the contract pr process the, uh, that certification. The CISSP, which Sean and I have, was one of only about half a dozen on the original list, but it covered the most variety of job types and therefore made sure we were the most flexible in being put onto specific task orders and work in that effort. Jennifer, did you want to add anything? Um, so to um, add on to Craig's comments, um, in the federal government also has requirements from managing um, government projects, engineering projects, or um, just general structure. Um, they passed an act called the Program Management Information and Accountability Act in 2015 um, that required all government-run um, projects and programs um, to be um, managed by a certified uh, project professional, whether it be a project manager or a program manager. Um, the DOD had already passed something similar, and that's the um, requirement that Craig was, was discussing. Um, why that's a really big deal is if you want to work on uh, government contracts and government projects, um, they can be quite lucrative, but it does require that certification and uh, maintenance. Um, so it is something that if you want to work in that space, in that industry, um, you really need to consider um, getting that certification and maintaining it. Um, and even if you don't have them now and want to get there, you can't even interview for some of those positions without having those certifications now. Okay, thank you. Um, so there was a question here about asking uh, the opinion on programs like Google uh, promoting a, I guess they're promoting a program to bypass university degrees doing some kind of, I guess, online learning in certain areas. Does anyone know anything about that? So um, it's very similar to a um, certificate program that Craig had mentioned earlier. Um, and you take a number of classes online. Um, typically, it's three to five classes. And it gives you some uh, proficiency within that space without a degree. So um, for individuals that know exactly what they want and they have a strong desire to be in a particular field, um, it is far less expensive and much quicker um, in many cases than pursuing a university degree or university certificate, um, but it is has a very narrow application. So it is something that you must be very sure of the path that you want to take and how you're gonna get there and the hiring company will accept that as an alternative method of education. Craig and or Greg, do you want to add on to that? If, uh, if, like I said earlier in my slides, the program that of education that a, uh, a, a, a student would follow to get to be an engineer They'll have some difficulty getting licensed unless that program is accredited by ABET EAC. Now, unlike uh, regional accrediting agencies, the ABET accreditation is per program. That means per the name written on your degree, not a blanket for an entire university. So I'd be very careful of a program you intend to lead toward a license uh, unless it is accredited by ABET EAC, including anything Google produces. And what I'd want to add to that is, as Jennifer said, the sorts of certificate training programs that would fall under the uh, Google process are tend to be towards the more technical and specifically focused, and they're going to pop up all along your career as technology and business practices change. Uh, one of the reasons for certifications with ongoing continuing education and, and the license 
is to make sure you are still keeping up with changes in the industry and your field. The need for a very specific focus area, especially in the world of computer systems information systems, has traditionally gone for the quick hit of can you do programming in a particular language? Can you do you understand how to manage a file system? Uh, it's, great it's great to have a computer science degree, degree but, but a lot of the stuff work done is not based on Google. It's done, it's done by people who are high focused high focus science. So so that's one, that's one, one of the distinctions for our CIA is a lot easier. Hey, Cragen. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, your audio is becoming very staticky. I don't know if your microphone or. Let me try to move my mic up. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to Okay, I'm going to switch mine to mine and see if that's the audio. I got to go back. Okay. So while Craig and switch microphones, we'll go to a different uh, question here. Uh, there was a question uh, that came in that says, can you apply for a PE without needing the amount of expertise, even though you passed the PE exam already? Uh, someone said that that was possible, but, but I wanted to verify. Um, don't know if they meant to say the FE or the PE in that second part of that question. But. Okay, uh, if one has the necessary accredited education uh, in an engineering approved program and has passed the FE exam, in most jurisdictions, that person is declared and have applied to the state licensing board. Now, that person is declared an engineer in training, or EIT. And during that time, it's expected that one would get the needed four years of experience. I don't know of any way one can get a license in any state or jurisdiction without at least four years of experience. And then uh, passing the PE exam. Some states allow you to take the exams prior to the experience. All states allow you to take the exams after the four years of experience. But I don't know of any state that exempts the experience. I will ask a corollary to that is uh, if you don't take the FE exam, what happens, what's the difference with the experience requirements at that point in time? The experience requirements, the experience date starts at the graduation from the bachelor's in engineering program, whether you take the FE or not. I didn't take the FE until after I had a doctorate. It worked just fine. And that's allowed. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? Craigan, do we want to see if your audio is working now? Yeah, I ch changed microphones to the built-in mic on the computer. Is this coming in more clearly? Oh, oh that's much better now. Okay, good. Okay, um, so I'm going to ask a question, um, another question here, and basically, so is it worth the time, effort, and frankly, the money that you have to put into all of this effort to get a license, licensure or cert certification or various other things? Short answer for me, if it focuses on where you want to go, either in intellectual development or in uh, career opportunities, definitely. I will tell you that nowhere did I need to get the doctorate, but I wanted it for my own uh, educational development and well worth it, very late in my prof professional life. Uh, the certification I got mid-career because that was where the job opportunities were. So if you're getting it just for the fun of it, you're going to have to make that decision. But if you've got a specific uh, personal accomplishment goal or career goal, then yes, it is. I'll answer for me. I had my doctorate uh, before I even thought about getting a license. 
And uh, I thought, well, you know, I've got a doctorate. Why do I need a license to do anything? And then I read the law. And it turns out you have to have a license. <laughs> you know. So uh, it was well worth it. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, having a doctorate doesn't hurt when you're trying to get trying to study for a license. That's true. Thanks. So I don't have an engineering uh, license, but I will say that having the professional certification and the ability to continually improve yourself, con continually learn, um, expand your horizon, it is huge. And for those of you who are interested in growing your career and becoming more successful, having a larger earning potential, the only way that you are gonna be able to do that is if you are on a continuous learning path. Um, I will tell you that I didn't never planned to get the first credential, but I was told that I would never get promoted unless I got it. Not only did I get it and get the promotion, I got a giant raise to go with it. And that was huge incentive for me. And at that point, I made a decision that every 18 to 24 months after that, I would go and get another credential. Since then, I've gotten a master's degree and seven more certifications in my field. Um, I teach at a major university. I've written five master's degree programs um, throughout the United States. Uh, it's a huge, huge factor is having all of that education and certification and a trajectory for lifelong learning. Thank you. Um, so yeah, another question we have here is that, okay, if I already have my PE, if I already have my my professional engineering license, are, or do I really need to go and get these extra certifications? All right, I'll take that one too. <laughs> uh, yes, you do. <laughs> Just like Jennifer was saying, uh, you, 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 you have to stay current. Um, I, I'm writing code now in languages that didn't exist when I was in college. I've taught courses in subjects that no one had ever heard of when I was in college. Uh, you, you can't survive in this world we're in, in, the, in a technical field of any kind, without keeping up and additional certification, additional knowledge, additional education is a, is a very good way to do that. And I would point out that although we talk about the uh, non-commercial certificates, uh, uh, academic certificates and certifications and such, if you're in the business of advising folks on what to buy and how to put it together, there is high value in going to the individual vendors' certificate programs for their products so you really understand their product and can do a good job of advising your client on what to look for, possibly which ones to select from. That, that has a high level of value when you're uh, looking at designing out a plan or a program that's going to require your client or your, your company to buy specific products to fit the overall goal. And I would add on this is a little bit of what we discussed earlier. Depending upon what your career goals are, there are going to be some um, employment requirements for you to have a certification path um, in addition to your educational experience. If you want to work, for example, for the federal government, um, you're going to have to have certification and education. It's a requirement now um, for uh, all DOD and federal government contracts for you to have that as well as within the agency itself. So think about that as you go forth because it's going to expand out and become larger and larger. I've already seen in the last five years since PAMEA was passed that the number of um, job offerings that require a credential in addition to the education markedly increased. So it, it's not going to go away. If anything, it's going to become more pronounced. Okay, thank you. Um, I, we're getting near the end of our session. Um, keep it, if you have any more questions, please feel free to put them in the, into the Q&A window. Uh, one uh, thing that I wanted to 
bring up one of the questions that we have is, um, you know, is that sometimes there's this negative connotation, and I think Dr. Craig and you would uh, mention this on uh, getting the alphabet soup after your name and basically, you know, having all of this list of credentials after your name, and that sometimes that seems uh, can, can get a negative connotation when you're either applying for something or or at work. So, what is the uh, you know what is your thoughts on that? Well, let me make one point. I noticed one of the other uh, scheduled panels for the uh, uh, Ada Cap New experience here has to do with job hunting and resumes. Never send a boilerplate standard, this covers everything resume for a job you really want. Customize what you send for your cover letter and your resume to highlight what they're looking for and you've done your research to know what they're looking for. If you send them the alphabet soup, if they don't know anything about you, one of the concerns, and this is what Sean was talking about, is, darn, this fellow spend, spends all his time doing his continuing education requirements for all of that alphabet, and he's not going to have time to do real work. Well, if, if you're really dedicated to doing it right, that's not what goes on, but that's an impression it gives. So get the ones that you want. Keep your master list if you're in academia, you put it on your curriculum vitae, your CV. They want to see everything, and that's a good thing there. But when you're looking for jobs out in the commercial world, need the government world, show the ones that apply to the job you're going for and maybe the job after that. And don't put the entire alphabet soup every time you say, this is who I am. Yeah, I will say as somebody who's been accused of the alphabet soup, because I have um, quite a few credentials after my name, um, it's really important um, as Craig mentioned, for you to put the ones that um, are applicable to that job. But it will also say, I have gotten interviews before because I had alphabet soup after my name. Um, they didn't know what all the credentials were, but the interviewer told me the reason I got the interview was I must be smart because I have all those initials after my name. So <laughs> it's not always bad <laughs> that you have after alphabet soup after your name. But it is important that they all mean something and they're all related. If you look, for example, at the alphabet soup after my name, they are all related to what I do every day. They are all built upon one another and they show progression in the field. If you look at um, what you want to be, what you want to do, the avenue that you want to pursue, make sure that your certification and education path follows along with that and takes you to the journey where you want to go. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Um, it came up in, in previous sessions, there has been discussion of engineering silos breaking down, that you no longer just work with other EEs or computer engineers, you need to work with biomed professionals or and in team science scenarios. Do cert certificates and programs help with this? Short answer, yes, because that shows that you're keeping up with the current technology and these cooperative programs and multidisciplinary programs. You've got to know what's happening today, not what was it being taught in the university five years ago. Greg or Jen? I, I agree yeah. uh, with what Craig and said. Uh, these certificates are going to help. And uh, we're fighting a battle where uh, the breadth of an engineering degree has been shrinking over the last 20 or so, 30 years maybe. And the engineering graduates these days are getting less of the courses in related fields than they did 20, 30 years ago. So it's more important to do exactly what he said. Exactly, and I think that those those types of um, certificates, credentials, et cetera, allow you to specialize or expand um, your area of expertise in a particular area. So case in point, you can be a PMP and not know anything about Agile, but then go get Agile certification or program management certification or some other uh, credential that allows you to broaden your horizons. And every discipline is set up in that way. So um, this is, has a lot to do with where you want to go and figure out how to get there and choose a path that will augment uh, your journey and help you get there faster. 
Okay, we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, do uh, you all want to do some final closing remarks? Jen, I guess you were the last to speak. I'll let you go first. All right. Um, so I would just say, um, I think the probably the biggest takeaway is um, never stop learning. It, you always have something new to learn. As Greg pointed out, um, there's a lot of things that are commonly sought after now that, you know, when we were in school, it weren't even thought of or discussed or anything. The first language I learned how to write on a computer isn't used anymore. Um, really, you need to keep learning and figure out how um, you can move forward and continually um, advance in your career. And for most people, that's something that they want to do. And the only way that you're going to do that is to make sure that you are a lifelong learner. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. The only computer language that I was really taught in college was Fortran. And I don't think I've ever programmed in it in uh, outside of that scenario. So uh, uh, Greg, do you have any closing remarks? If you have questions about licensure or engineering uh, 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 registration or professional engineering, uh, go to uh, nces.org, and uh, most of the answers you seek will be there. Craigan, any final remarks? Yeah, once you're out of uh, school and in the work environment, Take charge of your own plan for maintaining your ongoing training and education. Don't rely upon your employer to take care of it for you. Definitely research and find out what your employer may be willing to pay for, to give you time off for, but don't sit back and say, I'm not going to do anything unless the company pays for it. This is your career. No longer uh, do most workers stay with the same company for 20, 30, or 40 years. They now change jobs routinely every few years. So this is what you're going to do to maintain your career moving forward. Pay some of your own money, take some of your own time to do these things. That, that's a good point, because uh, I've actually wrestled with that myself, is that um, I've been thinking about trying to get my PMP, uh, but because it's not in the area that I am currently working at the company, they're not going to pay for it. So I've been wrestling with that question myself. So that's a good comment. So with that, um, I think that that's uh, pretty much our time. I want to thank everyone right. for coming. Uh, Stacy, do you want to uh, close us out? Thank, thanks, uh, Sean. It's Nancy Yost, and I'll go ahead and I'll, oh, I'll wrap this up. I want to thank you and your expert panel. It's really been fascinating. Lots of really great information. Thanks for all the resources.